On the screen you have a portion of the text that Ron just read for us from Romans chapter 1. Even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God. They did not give thanks, but they became, they had to do. I'm futile in my speaking. They became futile in their imaginations. Futile in their imaginations. What does it mean to be futile? What does futility mean? It means pointless, worthless. It doesn't work. It's futile. They imagined things that were pointless, that did not work. Their heart was darkened, and he talks about their speculations. What's a speculation? A speculation is what you have when you don't know, or you think you don't know, and so you, you come up with something. You make something up. Those speculations were pointless. Those imaginations were pointless. Those are the things that Paul is writing to and addressing in Romans, the first chapter. I want to talk about this morning this idea of evolution. And let me talk about the, uh, the kind of evolution specifically I'm talking about. And that's the kind of evolution that puts God out of the picture. In other words, things became somehow and they changed somehow until the becoming and the changing is now us. That's a futile speculation. It's exactly what that is. It's an imagination that has no bearing in real science. This guy, this is a, an artist's impression of what Neanderthal might have looked like. I didn't know they had Argyle sweaters back then, but anyway, he's, he's apparently got one pretty good. Neanderthal man, He's named for remains that were found in the Neander Valley of Germany. So where were they found? The Neander Valley of Germany. That's why he's called Neanderthal. He had a similar brain capacity to us. The remains that have been found indicate that he walked upright. He wasn't stooped over like an ape, but he walked erect. That wasn't always believed about him, but it is now believed based on the remains. Why is he not considered simply a human being? Here's another artist's impression of what Neanderthal might have looked like. Now that's a little bit different from the guy on the front page, but then here's another one. Oh boy. What's that tell us? That tells the people who made these drawings didn't know what he looked like. What were they doing? They were speculating. They were imagining and that's what they came up with. But here's another artist's impression. I'm saying an artist's impression because this is a, a mannequin, a, a, a man form made for a museum. And he looks pretty interesting. But then there's this guy. Isn't that neat? When it turns, he looks the different direction. Yeah. Uh, ain't, ain't technology great? I think I saw that guy last week at a truck stop. I know, it's, it's funny to us, isn't it? Because this is, this is another picture that's being portrayed. This is what Neanderthal looked like. But he doesn't look like the previous guys, so do they know what Neanderthal looked like? And I don't think they did. Here's another version of Neanderthal. Isn't he a pensive-looking fellow? Just sitting there thinking about things. Wonder what he's thinking about. I think I might know. All you teenage boys, hold on to your hats. Here's... <laughs> Neander babe, that's what he's thinking about. Now we're having fun. <clears throat> and I'm, I'm not really trying to make fun, but when you look at this and you think this is what we're being told is a substitute for God, what did God say in the beginning? He created everything in six days and he rested on the seventh. Created man from the dust of the earth, and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Man became a living soul. From man's side he took flesh, and he created a woman, brought her to the man. And he said, whoa, man, because that's what she was, of the man. We still say the same thing today. That's what God says. This is what the world says. Now, by the way, there's Neanderthal right there staring into, I don't know if that's Yorick. You remember, if you're a Shakespearean fan, you might remember who Yorick was, but... You can look that up later. But this Neanderthal, evidence is that he walked erect. He used animal skins for clothing. 
He made and he used tools. Animals don't do that. Apes don't do that. He practiced ceremonial burial. He had brain capacity well within that of modern man. Why is he not considered a modern man? This is our most famous Neanderthal right there. He's the crowd favorite. 50 million years or less. I don't think that's his line, but... By the way, not 15 million years. How long has man, according to those who claim to know, how long has man been on the earth? About three million years. Now, you might think that in three million years, there'd be a lot more fossil evidence for the existence of, of the missing links, but there's just not that much, not that much at all. Most of them that we do find, or the, the remains of humans that we do find, I think were buried in the flood for the most part. Heidelberg man, Heidelberg, Germany is where this guy's from, based on a single jawbone found near Heidelberg in 1907. Just that jawbone right there. Claims persist from folks to think he's a link in the evolutionary chain, but now others have conceded, well, okay, it's just a human jawbone. So there's no Heidelberg man. However, when you look at the drawings, the original drawings that they came up with of Heidelberg man, this is, this is what they thought he looked like. This man from monkey idea kept being perpetuated until research came along and they figured out, well, maybe he didn't look so much like that. Maybe he looked more like that. What's that look like? It looks like a man. It looks like a human being because that's what Heidelberg man was. But here's another concept of what Heidelberg man might have looked like. What have they got to work on? A jawbone. A jawbone. And this is what they've come up with. Speculation. In imagination, here's another picture of the Heidelberg man. Isn't he quite a bit different from that other guy? I'm not talking about color of his skin. I'm talking about just the shape of his face and his skull. Everything is different. That's because speculation, futile imagination. They don't know. Now here are some Dinka ladies, not Dinky ladies, but Dinka ladies from the Dinka tribe in South Sudan in the continent of Africa the tallest people in the world, standing next to an average sized man, you can see how tall they are. I wonder how tall the men are. Here's a, a regular sized man, regular sized man, standing next to some members of the Mabuti tribe from Congo in the continent of Africa. Why am I showing you these pictures? Today, when you look at the range of human size and shape and form, there's quite a variety, quite a range. Why would it surprise us that when we find human remains in the ground, fossilized or otherwise, that they might take on some shapes and have some forms that are a little bit different from what we see today? It's, it's common knowledge. If you were to compare, oh, some of the shortest people you know with the NBA basketball players you know, there would be quite a bit of difference. And by the way, I wanted to show you these pictures also because there are people who have uh, giantism and dwarfism. But we're not talking about the abnormalities in people. We're talking about races of people who are tall and races of people whose stature is smaller. That's a regular thing. You've got to wonder what was lost as far as human form goes in the flood? What was covered over with God's wrath in that day? What missing links are we talking about here? We've got Neanderthal man who turns out he was just human. We've got Heidelberg man who was just human. Are there more? Yeah, there's, there's a bunch more. I'm just going to show you a few more. But the next of the few is Piltdown man. The English weren't to be outdone. Because Neanderthal, where was he named for? The Neander Valley in Germany. Heidelberg man, a city in Germany. The Germans are coming up with these guys. So the English, hey, we've got to find some too. So... We got the Piltdown Man. He was discovered, quote unquote, by Charles Dawson, not Charles Darwin, but Charles Dawson, in a, in a pit near Piltdown, England. And 40 years later, it was determined that this was a hoax that he had perpetrated for fame and fortune. It was definitively proven to be a hoax in 2016 when we got a few more uh, means to determine whether or not something was human based on DNA. But 40 years of this guy running around, Piltdown Man. If you were a, a science a geek, you would have looked into the books and the magazines and you would have seen a picture of this guy. But you also would have seen a picture 
Now this guy, I don't, I don't know why. I lean away from the microphone to cough, and I got it right here on my neck. I don't know why I do that, but I make a monkey out of myself, I guess. But, but don't you see some difference between these two images of what the Piltdown man would have looked like? Yeah, this guy looks, he really looks just like a monkey head on a man's body. So they didn't know, they were speculating, they were imagining. What missing links have we got so far? We got Neanderthal, who was human, we got a Heidelberg, who was human, we got a Piltdown man who never actually existed. What was happening? 1859, Charlie Darwin published his book on the origin of species. And as a result of that book, humanity now had a scientific means to push God out of the picture. Aha! Science says that man evolved. He wasn't created in the beginning by a loving God who had a plan for him. He came about by millions of years of small changes. That's what people began to think, and they had a way to get around God. And so the search for fossilized evidence of the ascendance of man became a thing. And people began to look for him because it gave them fame and it gave them fortune. That's what it was all about back in the day. Well, we weren't to be outdone here in North America. We got Nebraska man. His existence was based on a lone tooth, one tooth, found in Nebraska in 1917. You ever wonder when you go to the dentist and they pull your teeth, what happens to those teeth? Somebody's going to find those in a thousand years and they're going to say, looky here. Anyway, Nebraska man was heralded as evidence of the first higher primate in North America. That's what we are, we're higher primates. It was retracted in 1927. Why was it retracted in 1927, 10 years later? It was retracted because the tooth was determined to be from a peccary or a pig. They took another look at that tooth and you know what, that's, not, that's a pig's tooth. Oh yeah, you're right, that is a pig's tooth. Hmm, I guess Nebraska man will have to go. The, the original corn husker turned out to be actually a razorback. <laughs> I, we're laughing. And you'll say, Marty, you're just making fun. No, the fun's built into it. It's just built into it. What kind of speculations? Foolish speculations. What kind of imaginations? Foolish imaginations. Who would look at you and say that you're just an accident? I mean, we cause accidents and some, we're hot messes, we say. But, but you're a very, if we only looked at each other on a purely physical basis, how complex are you? As we speak, your body is replicating itself. Your cells are being recreated by your body, and you don't have anything to do with it consciously. You're not as a person going, okay, I need some more elbow cells down there because my elbow skin's getting a little worn out. I need some more elbow skin. Oh, I need to replace some of these skin cells in my eye. By the way, how does your body know that the cells in your eye are different from the cells in your elbow? Pretty neat machine, isn't it? How many systems do you have? You've got a skeletal system, a nervous system, you've got a digestive system. What happens when those things don't work right? We go to the doctor. We want our systems to be put back in place. Something's out of order. It's got to be fixed. Systems don't come from accidents. We didn't come from an accident. So what missing links do we have so far? Neanderthal was human. Heidelberg was human. Piltdown man never existed. Nebraska man, he was a pig. What about Java man, the coffee man? One more tooth, first discovered in 1891. And then they found a skull cap about a month later. Found a couple of femurs and another tooth a year later and 15 meters away. 15 meters is about 45 to 50 feet away. So it probably wasn't even from the same individual. The teeth and femurs appear human. The skull cap later on they determined was actually from a large gibbon. What's a gibbon? It's a big monkey. So there's no Java man. However, there is a book about Java man. What does this say? Let me read that. How two ge uh, geologists... 
Can you read it? Oh, yeah, I can read it better up there. G dramatic discoveries changed our understanding of the evolutionary path to modern humans. Right. Those aren't the two geologists, by the way. <laughs> That's supposed to be depictions of Java Man. But wait a minute, did they ever find a skull of Java Man? They never found a skull. They had a skull cap, but they determined, well, that's actually the skull cap of a gibbon, a large monkey. But what does this guy look like? Well, he looks kind of monkey-ish. Why? Because that's what they're hoping to find. That's what they're expecting to find. They're foolishly speculating and foolishly imagining that man ascended from apes. And so when they recreate what they think they've got as our ancestors, they're going to make them look like apes. They're going to give them hair. They're going to give them facial features that have that aspect, and that's what we've got. And then we see the same book, just republished with a different cover, Java Man, same book, but what do you notice is on the front? Picture of a skull, do they have a skull of Java Man? No skull, but you see that on the front. Seems to me just a little bit misleading. What missing links do we have so far? Well, we got the Neanderthal, he's human. We got Heidelberg man, he's human. We got Piltdown man, he never actually existed. We got Nebraska man, he turned out to be a pig. We got Java man, he was a gibbon. What do we know from real science? Real science, what do we know? We know the order does not come from accidents. When's the last time you had an accident that fixed something? And, and we're not talking about one accident, we're talking about a, a series of millions and millions of accidents that brought you into being. That's what we're talking about when we're talking about this kind of evolution. It wasn't God who created anything in the beginning. It wasn't God who's been working his will in our lives all along. It's just a series of accidents and here we are. It's not science. Order is an expression of mentality. When you find order somewhere, you know that someone has been there and created whatever order there is. Somebody did that. It did not happen by accident because order does not come by accident. What are you looking at? You, I, I took this picture up in North Dakota. We were going through the Teddy Roosevelt National Forest and there was a lot of petrified stuff. And I, and I saw this and I said, I gotta take a picture of that because wow, what do you know when you look at that? It's just four pieces of petrified wood. But isn't it obvious to you, doesn't it seem obvious that somebody did that? Did they appear accidentally or does that look like somebody found those and put them in place the way they want them to be? That's what that looked like to me. So I took a picture of it. I thought, oh, that's interesting. And here I am several years later using it in a lesson to show order does not come by accident. Abiogenesis is worse than a fairy tale. What's abiogenesis? You look it up, this is the idea that life came from non-life. If there is no God, then this is what had to happen. There was no life, and then boom, there came to be life. Now, scientists have been trying to recreate life in the laboratory for a long time. There's been a lot of time and a lot of money. Some of the best minds in science have been trying to do that, and they haven't been able to do it. They claim that they've done it, but when you look at those claims, no, they haven't done it. They take things that already exist, and they create maybe an amino acid, but they, they don't create life. If they ever did create life, it would only prove that it takes mentality to do it. But they haven't even done it yet. That's abiogenesis. It's the idea that life comes from non-life. Science says that life does not come from non-life. Science says, real science, observable science, says that life only comes from that which is already alive. What about the second law of thermodynamics? What's that all about? It's called entropy. It just means that things are running down. Things don't naturally get better. You just walk away from your house for a week. You don't even have to walk away from it. Live in it for a week. Don't clean anything, don't put anything away and see what the place looks like after a week. Things do not naturally get better. If you want things to improve, if you want there to be order, you have to use mentality to make it better, to bring about order. And when you look at the universe, there's all kinds of order and it didn't come about by accident because science shows us that's not the way it happened. What are you thinking? Is it not amazing to you? that you can think at all? What is a thought? You can't hold it in your hand. You can't look at it with your eyes. You can't smell it. 
You can't touch it. You can't hear a thought. What we can do is we can try to put our thoughts down in words. But if you've ever tried that, I've tried it a lot. It, you just really can't do it. You can get some ideas down, but, but, but to express yourself completely with words, it's nigh on to impossible if it's not exactly impossible. And yet you are filled with thoughts because you're a conscious being. There is no natural explanation for why you have thoughts. No natural explanation for your consciousness but you are conscious. Somebody said, we look up into the, the night sky and we see the stars and the planets. And we think how vast a universe we are in and it makes us feel smaller, it might make us feel small, but the observation was made, none of those heavenly bodies are aware of your existence, but you're aware of their existence. And there is all the difference. My conclusion, I know we haven't talked about all of this, but here's my conclusion that you were created by God in his own image. Why do I conclude that? Because that's what God says. What did Hal pray in his prayer? Did you hear it this morning? He repeated it. What do you say about Jesus? That we believe. We believe. I appreciate that, Hal. We believe. I read Genesis 1 and I believe it because it makes more sense than anything else that I've ever heard in all my life. And I've studied, I've tried to figure things out. I've tried to find what other people are saying about how the universe came into being and how mankind came into being. Nothing compares with Genesis chapter 1. Nothing. God created us all in his own image. Your sin separated you from God. You ever felt guilty? And the answer to that is, duh, we all feel guilt. But why? Why do we feel guilt if we are the result of some natural process where there is no spiritual being behind it all? If you used to be a monkey and now you're a man, there's no purpose for your existence. There's no reason for your existence. You're just here because you're an accident. Why is there such a thing as guilt? And why is it so universal? Why is... A sense of morality so universal in humanity. You don't go anywhere in the world where people don't have a sense of morality, of right and wrong. Now, some of those moral codes might have some differences to them, but everywhere you go, there is a sense of morality. People understand guilt. And this is what it's all about. Our sin that separated us from the God who created us in his image. And then there's Jesus who came and paid my debt of sin and your debt of sin, and this is his deal. We put our faith in him as, as his faithful, obedient servants, and he counts our faith as righteousness. I don't have any righteousness. You don't have any righteousness. But when you put your faith in Jesus, God looks at you and says, I'm counting you as righteous. I'm going to take my righteousness and credit it to you because you put your faith in me. That's a pretty good deal. Jesus continually washes away our sin when we walk in his light. Doesn't mean being perfect, it means walking in the light. It means holding up his law in front of ourselves and using that as a standard for our life. And I look at my behavior, I look at my thoughts, and wow, I'm a mess. I don't behave right, I don't talk right, I don't think right. Why do I think that? Why do I conclude that? Because my standard is God's word. That's what walking in the light is all about, using God's standard as the, or God's word as the standard for your life. You can't be perfect. That's why Jesus died. And he wants to bring us into his presence for eternity. Not three million years. Not 14.5 billion years. You ever, they, they always put a point after it. Why do they put a point after it? Because that makes it sound official. If you know there's a point something, then you, you've got it nailed down pretty good. But what is that? That is a foolish speculation. A foolish imagination. My point this morning was not to poke fun. Like I said, I think the fun's already built into this. My point is to show there are no missing links. There is no trail of ascendancy from ape to men. There is God, and there is you. And there is your sin that stands between you and him, 
And then there is Jesus, the one who makes it all as it was in the beginning. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we love you and we thank you for what you've shown us. We thank you for presenting us with your word so we can read and see and understand. We can believe that you are the true and living God and that all things exist and we exist because you brought it into being. Help us, Father, in living in this world to be careful of those things that are foolish speculations and foolish imaginations in your eyes. Help us to be as kind and loving as possible, but also, Father, help us to not shy away from holding to the truth and telling the truth and being honest with people. There's no other way for anyone to be saved except coming to the truth of your word. So we ask you these blessings and we ask you for this help in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to stand and sing a song of encouragement and invitation. If you realize that you are guilty, that you didn't come from a monkey, but you came from God, but now you've been separated by your sin, you want to come back? We want to help you with that this morning. If you have situations in your life that need praying for, we want to stop and pray with you. That's what we're here for. Let's stand and sing the invitation song together for anybody who might want to come down.